is for education and entertainment purposes only. Please consult with your healthcare provider before making any changes to your health plan. Hey beautiful soul, it's Jacqueline from the Las Labia Chronicles in partnership with Lichen Sclerosis Support Network. If you are looking to empower yourself with information, find acceptance and reclaim your life, then please subscribe to our channel and please keep on watching. And if you have a friend or family member or loved one with lichen sclerosis, and you want to learn more about the mental health and physical health aspects of living with LS so that you can better support them in their journey, then please subscribe to our channel and please share it with them as well. All right, so a few weeks ago, I published a video on sexual health symptoms and lichen sclerosis. And that video was really meant to be a general kind of overview where I kind of highlighted all of the different symptoms that folks may experience with lichen sclerosis, but I didn't really take a deep dive. That was more of an overview. Um, and then in future videos, I kind of take a deeper dive into those things. For example, overactive pelvic floor and pain with sex. That was one of the symptoms. And then we did a video with Dr. Mukta Chauhan, which I will pop a card up here. And I will also leave that video linked in the description box below if you want to check that out. So today is one of those deeper dive videos. And today the topic that we are going to be addressing is tearing with insertion. So insertion being with a speculum, a tampon, a toy, a penis, etc. When something is inserted into the vagina, you experience painful tearing. That's what we're going to be talking about today. So we're going to look at what areas of the vulva tend to tear, why lichen sclerosis skin is more prone to tearing, who is more likely to experience tearing, and then we're going to talk about a few ways to kind of help manage this incredibly distressing symptom that some of us happen to live with. As always, if you find the information in this video helpful, please give us a like and please subscribe to our channel. All right, so first we're going to talk about what areas tend to be more prone to tearing, uh, specifically when we're talking about um, insertion. So again, we're using the term insertion here very, very widely to refer to something being inserted into the vagina. So that can be a penis, but it can also be a speculum, right? At a gynecology exam, it could be a toy, it could be a finger, it could be a whole host of things. So we're talking about something being inserted and that causes the, the vulva to essentially tear for some folks. And I do want to say that for folks who are maybe newly diagnosed or kind of just in the beginning journey of learning about lichen sclerosis, I do want to highlight that just because you have LS does not guarantee that you are going to experience this symptom. I know people who have had lichen sclerosis for over 40 years and never once, never once did they experience tearing with insertion. So it's not a guarantee that you have LS that you're going to get this. But with that said, there are definitely folks who experience this. I happen to be one of them. Um, so if you follow my story, you know that pain with sex and tearing with sex were two of my earliest and most distressing symptoms that I lived with. And I wouldn't just tear on occasion, I would tear almost all the time when there was something being inserted into my vagina. So let's talk about when I say tearing, where, where are those areas? Which areas tend to tear when we're talking about something being inserted? So I am going to kind of show on this model, um, but then we're also going to have a little diagram up at one point so you can kind of see where those are, where those are located. If you uh, are looking for more information about vulvar anatomy, uh, we do have a free event that we hosted that was vulva education and vulva awareness. So there's a whole anatomy overview in the first section of that video and that replay is available on our YouTube channel. So if you go to the live playlists, you'll find that there if you want a more comprehensive overview. So basically, 
We're all probably familiar with my Volva Puppet from the Body Agency at this point in time. So these maroon colored outer lips, those are the labia majora, the outer ones. The inner lips, these kind of crimson colored or red magenta, um, those are your labia minora. Up at the top, this kind of dark blue hood here is the clitoral hood, and then this pink circular bulb is your clitoral glands. And then if we open it, this kind of, well not kind of, it's very white, this white area is the vestibule. So at the top of the vestibule below the clitoral glands, you have your urethra, and then towards the base of the vestibule, you'll have the opening of the vagina. It's also called the introidal opening, the vaginal opening, etc. So the areas that tend to tear or most commonly tear with insertion are right below the vaginal opening. <clears throat> so let's pretend we have the opening here. It's kind of right at the base of that vaginal opening, although some people can kind of tear on the sides too, just kind of around the vaginal opening. And then right below the vaginal opening, you have something called the fourchette. So the fourchette is basically kind of below. It's a fold of skin that kind of sits in between the space of the vaginal opening and the, peri, uh, the perineum. And then the perineum can also tear. So the around the vaginal opening, the fourchette, and then the perineum. So again, I'm gonna pop a little picture there for a second so you can kind of get acquainted. Maybe pause the screen for a second so you can just really see where those three kind of main areas are located. But those do tend to be the areas that will most commonly tear with insertion and lichen sclerosis. All right, let's talk about why is lichen sclerosis skin more prone to tearing? So what is it about it? What is it about our skin that makes us more predisposed to experiencing tearing with insertion? Well, a lot of this has to do with skin texture. So lichen sclerosis, lichenification is thickening of the skin and sclerosis is the scarring. So there's a lot of skin thickness that is involved. So the epidermis is kind of the top layer of skin and then below that you have the dermis, those are kind of the top middle layers. That dermis layer for folks with lichen sclerosis is very, very thick. So maybe on the top, it might appear thinned out, but right below, we're talking about very, very thick skin. Now, the reason thick skin is problematic in this particular instance, there are other reasons why it can be problematic and cause symptoms, but that's a different video, is that thick skin is rigid. It's really, really tough and it doesn't really move well. So lichen sclerosis skin, as it progresses, when it's not treated, it becomes more and more rigid, more and more inflexible. So the way that I like to explain this is I have two elastics, okay? One is thicker. I think this is from like a head of broccoli. Um, so this will represent lichen sclerosis skin. So if we try to stretch, like let's pretend this is the vaginal opening and we want this area to stretch to accommodate insertion of something, it's really hard you can see that my arms are shaking, trying to stretch it out. It doesn't want to, right? There's not a lot of give. There's not a lot of flexibility or mobility because again, it's hardened, it's thickened, it's rigid. Now let's take this elastic, for example. This elastic, if I try to move it, moves very, very easily. So this would be kind of non-lichen sclerosis skin and non-lichen sclerosis skin without that lichenification and scarring, it has a lot of mobility and flexibility so that when we try to insert something, it can easily accommodate with no resistance. So that is how I explain, you know, what is kind of going on with the skin and why with lichen sclerosis, because this is so thick and tough and resistance and inflexible, when it's trying to stretch, it's almost like you're stretching something past its breaking point, it will literally crack and fissure and tear the skin. Which, by the way, as someone that experienced that for over a decade, is incredibly painful and incredibly distressing. Like when it first happened to me, I was terrified. So 
I always, you know, when I talk about these things, I'm always mindful that I'm talking about it in a clinical way, but I always kind of want to bring it back to the kind of real life experience of it all, which is a very distressing one uh, because nobody ever tells us that our bodies can tear like that. You know, I, I definitely wasn't prepared for it. So that is why the skin tends to tear with insertion for folks with lichen sclerosis. Um, and again, just want to name and acknowledge how frustrating it is, how distressing it is to have to live with this and to have to deal with it, especially when it starts to become a recurrent issue. Are there folks that are more predisposed to tearing than others? Good question. Um, so for this question of who might be more prone to tearing, I am pulling on research from Krapf et al. Uh, this was a recent 2022 publication on lichen sclerosis in premenopausal folks. So we're looking at kind of late teen to early 50s kind of general window. Now, of course, we know there are folks that can go into menopause earlier, but that's the kind of generalish window that we're looking at here. Um, for this study, they were specifically looking at people between the ages of 18 and 50, so that kind of premenopausal range. And what they were looking to see was, do people in that age group present with symptoms differently than, say, children or people who are menopausal or postmenopausal? And their qualitative study revealed that, yes, in fact, people in that premenopausal area do seem to present with different symptoms. So instead of itch being the most common symptom, for folks in that age group, the most common symptom was actually tearing. Uh, actually, first it was pain, pain with sex at 60, uh, 68% and then tearing with insertion at 63%. So the top two symptoms that folks in that age group struggle with are pain with sex and tearing with sex. So that age group does seem more predisposed to experiencing more sexual health related symptoms. And I'm gonna pop this slide up really quickly. This, was, um, this is a slide that I made for a presentation that I gave at the Holistic Healing Summit, the 2023 one, where I did an overview of current research. And this is a slide from Dr. Kraps. Uh, 2022 paper, again, highlighting the three main symptoms that folks um, in that kind of pre-menopause category experienced along with the top three skin changes. So again, you know, and that, I have to say that that study for me was really, really validating because all the kind of narratives that I heard around lichen sclerosis after I was diagnosed was that it's itchy. Lichen sclerosis is itchy. Itch, itch, itch was all I heard. And I kind of felt really bizarre because itch was never really a big part of my symptoms of my LS journey. For me, it was so sexual health related. It was pain with sex and tearing with insertion and issues with my clitoris, clitoral pain, clitoral loss of sensation. That's what I was going through. So I found this study to be, you know, really validating and spoke to, yeah, because in my 20s, that was happening to me. I would always tear with insertion. So that kind of helped me make, make sense of it all. Quick caveat before we move on, research is never or almost never as straightforward as it appears. So this is not to say that if you are 60, that you don't experience tearing. You may experience tearing at a younger age or an older age, right? It's just that they found that people in that group tended to have those symptoms over itch, just like the opposite holds, right? There are folks in that premenopause category that do have itch as their primary symptom. So I just wanna kind of make it clear that it's not always as straightforward. So if you're sitting here and you're younger and you're like, but I am itchy, that's okay. That study doesn't invalidate that. That is your experience and that is absolutely true. Just like it is true and valid if somebody who is menopausal or postmenopausal is experiencing tearing. It's just that, you know, this study kind of highlights that folks in that premenopausal category may be more predisposed to experiencing this as their primary symptom. 
All right, so at this point, we have discussed which areas are more prone to tearing, why that skin is more predisposed to tearing, and which age groups are more likely to maybe experiencing tearing with insertion. Now, I want to kind of overview some different ways to kind of help manage the recurrent tearing. So kind of talking about people that really tend to tear kind of over and over again and experience this as a continued symptom, not necessarily someone that experiences it once a year or something. We're talking about people that kind of have this as a chronic symptom of theirs. So we're going to review a few strategies and ways to kind of um, manage this. So the first thing you can do to kind of work on helping uh, reduce future tearing is, and this is going to seem, you know, a little bit obvious, but I want to mention it just in fact, it's not for some people. And that is to follow your treatment plan. Now, for many of us, that is going to include topical corticosteroids. This is my ointment, my I use clebatasol. Um, so using your treatment plan, plan and following it as directed is very, very important because steroids are used to slow the progression of the disease. So that scarring and that thickening that we were speaking of earlier, that can continue to progressively get worse if we're not treating. So if that's progressively getting worse, it's making it more likely for skin to tear, crack and fissure down the line. So at bare minimum, we want to be staying on top of it, making sure that things don't get any worse. Now, clebatazole and or steroids in general, I usually say clebatazole just out of habit because that's what I treat with, but I use that usually as an overall kind of catchphrase for any kind of topical corticosteroid, um, mamedazone, betamethasone, halobetazole, any of those really, uh, you know, we're using that as a preventative and they are used to help improve the skin texture. So there can be some improvement to the texture of the skin. So that um, kind of dermal thickening, it kind of reduces and gets it so that it can, you know, be a little bit more pliable. Um, now, of course, you know, we know that steroids can't reverse scarring, unfortunately, right now, and that's why we're going to talk about some other modalities. Um, but it's also important that we speak about prevention, right? So using it, prevention, getting the skin to get as healthy as possible and slowing down the progression is the number one tip for insert tearing with insertion. Now, in addition to treatment, you might also want to try exploring pelvic floor physical therapy. Now, I'm going to kind of talk about these tips in increasing order. So we're going to talk about some kind of uh, conservative methods first to try before going to, you know, less conservative measures that may come with a little bit more risk. So this one is one that is very low risk and on the more conservative end of things. So a pelvic floor physical therapist, they are able to do kind of scar tissue mobilization um, and use techniques to kind of break up that fibrotic skin. Fibrotic skin is basically thick, hard, rigid skin. So they want to work on that scar tissue to increase mobility and elasticity and encourage blood flow to the area. So, and I'm going to use my Evolva Puppet again. So a lot of folks do experience tearing around the base of the vaginal opening and that kind of foreshot area. So they can do gentle kind of uh, techniques and mobility work on these areas to kind of stretch it out and to kind of, again, break up those that scarred thick skin again, right? So they can do that. There's also something called a peroneal massage, which you do with your thumb. Now they can do that kind of for you or they can teach you how to do it yourself, or they can just do it for you completely. If you're like, I don't want to do that on my body. No, thank you. Um, they, you can just come in and they will do that for you. So that can be one way to kind of work on improving that scar tissue and kind of make it more like this elastic here, right? Make it more stretchy, make it more extensible and flexible and mobile. That's what we're trying to do. So that's a kind of conservative measure that you can do to kind of work on tearing with insertion. 
Building on the point of working with a pelvic floor physical therapist, if you think, and by the way, working with a pelvic floor physical therapist is very important, especially if you think or you suspect that you may also have overactive pelvic floor. Overactive pelvic floor essentially just means that your muscles, your pelvic floor muscles are too tight. They're unable to relax. Now we do have a video on overactive pelvic floor and pain with sex and tearing with sex with Dr. Magda Chauhan. Again, card up here and linked in the description box below if you wanna check that out. But if you have a tight pelvic floor and you've got that thick fibrotic scar tissue skin, then again, that does kind of predispose you and make you more likely to experience recurrent tearing. So that's why it's important to see a PT, but also building on that, another thing that you can do is you can try something called heat therapy. This is another conservative measure, full transparency. There's no papers on this. This is just something that I do myself. Um, and then I know others have found some benefit too. So I'm sharing it with you. Feel free to pick and choose from all of these options. You never have to do exactly what I do. Um, but let's talk about heat therapy for a second. Essentially it involves basically using a vulvar heat pack. So what I use, I use the brand Pri private packs, which are non-toxic gel pads that you can make cold or hot. So I often talk about them in the context of ice therapy for itch and pain and inflammation, but they also have their use as a warm pack. So you can either warm it by kind of microwaving it for five to 10 seconds. Be mindful of that because everybody's microwave is slightly different. So just maybe do little small intervals first, or you can submerge it if you don't have a microwave or don't wanna use a microwave. You can submerge it in hot water, leave it there for a few minutes, that pack gets nice and warm. And then basically you're gonna lie that, again, with that protective sleeve, um, you know, just to make sure that we don't burn our vulvas or anything. We always want a protection, um, a little protective layer. It does, private packs do come with that protective layer. And then basically, you're just gonna kind of rest it against the vulva. And what that does is that warmth, that heat, it brings blood flow to the vulvar tissues as well as to the pelvic floor muscles. And heat for muscles works really well to relax muscles. So again, building on that, if you think you also have pelvic uh, overactive pelvic floor where your pelvic floor muscles are tight, that heat can kind of relax them because if they're tight, and the skin is thick and fibrotic, again, it's more likely to tear. So we wanna kind of get things to settle and relax a little bit before. Uh, this is something that I still do sometimes before I have sex, I will do that. I will also sometimes do, if I feel that I'm like a little bit more tense than usual, I'll often listen to a meditation at the same time or do some deep pelvic floor breathing. I like to really just kind of optimize things down there and kind of again stack the cards in my favor you know i'm a huge fan of stacking the cards in my favor if you do want to get private packs i do have a discount code you can use code all capital letters the lost labia chronicles at checkout to get 15 percent off of your first order i definitely recommend getting a few packs so that you can kind of leave them leave a couple in the freezer so that you have those on rotation and then also you can have a couple just that are just kind of hanging around outside that you can heat up for when you need to another conservative measure that you can do to help if you experience recurrent tearing especially if you have scarring around the vaginal opening and again this isn't foolproof may not work for everyone but may be worth trying and seeing if it works for your body. I know it's worked for a couple people, so hey, it could work for you, worth mentioning, is to experiment with positions. So depending on the position that you're in, you can kind of you know, play with angles so that that scar tissue isn't being hit as directly. So some people prefer to kind of be on top so that they have a little bit more control and then you kind of work slowly to figure out which kind of angle is best for you. Um, you may want to modify how you do missionary positions. I don't know if you've seen the, I don't actually know what it's called. I call it the sex wedge pillow, but it, it basically looks like a wedge. Um, I'll, pop, I'll pop up an image on the screen um, instead of me doing this awkward uh, thing. Um, 
and pop up an image, but that can kind of help with different angles um, and make certain positions more comfortable. So again, a lot of this is experimenting and seeing if we can kind of move some of that tissue out of the way um, so that it's not going to tear. Again, not foolproof, but I've heard a couple people that say that they experimented, they found their angle that works, and that's like their you know go-to kind of position because they know that they'll be safe in that position. So you can always try experimenting with positions to see if that helps. This last kind of conservative measure tip is again, not rooted in any kind of scientific studies. It's more anecdotally based and based off the live experiences of myself and of others. And that is to double up on protection. Okay, so we've all heard lube, lube, use more lube. We know that, right? For the most part, we know that. I'll say it anyways, just in case folks don't use a lot of lube, but double up on it. So here's what that means. That doesn't mean use more lube. It means instead, let's say that you tend to tear right around this area here. Then what you would do is you would take something like a barrier cream. So something that's thicker and creates a more protective layer. So something like Vaseline or Aquaphor. Every time I mention Aquaphor, I do feel the need to put a little disclaimer that Aquaphor contains lanolin, which can be... Um, there are folks who have lanolin allergies, so always, always, always patch test new products and make sure because you don't want to put Aquaphor everywhere and then have your whole vulva swell up and that's how you learn that you have a lanolin allergy, right? So I always just want to put that little disclaimer first just to kind of prevent that unfortunate reaction for folks. But so something like Vaseline or Aquaphor and put a nice amount, like create a nice little barrier over that tear. So we're kind of sealing it off and kind of hiding it behind a protective layer. Now that layer isn't foolproof, right? I don't want to set expectations that it's a perfect barrier, but it helps, right? So we've got that barrier and then, then you also, this is the double up concept, then you throw more lube on everywhere, including that. So now you kind of have two layers of protection. You have that underlying barrier cream and then you have the lubrication on top. Now, again, that's not foolproof. This won't work for everyone or it might work a little bit, but it's not perfect. That's kind of where I was. It wasn't perfect, but it definitely improved things. And sometimes I didn't tear, sometimes I would, but it wasn't maybe as bad. Again, this is based off lived experiences. So it's something for you to try try and it's something that is you know again more conservative doesn't really come with too too many risks so it's a nicer kind of area to start playing around with and then if that doesn't work then we can look at some less conservative measures which we're going to talk about next all right so the next tip or kind of suggestion for managing or correcting recurrent tearing is a surgical procedure called a vulvar lysis of adhesions. This might sound familiar. You've probably heard about the clitoral lysis of adhesions. Well, they can also do this procedure for other areas of the vulva, depending on what the problem is. And they do perform this for something that is a bit of a tongue twister, vulvar granuloma fissuratum. Yes, it sounds like I am casting a spell or something, but that is the medical term. Uh, again, as always, I introduce the medical term and then we're just going to put it aside. We're just going to call it recurrent tearing or tearing for short. Um, but now you know what that medical term is called. And there is a procedure again called the vulvar lysis of adhesions to surgically correct that area so that you um, don't experience recurrent tearing. So let's talk about that procedure a little bit. And I'm mostly drawing on a paper by Flynn et al. that was published in 2015. So again, I'm gonna grab my little vulva puppet here. So what they will do is, let's say you have a lot of scar tissue, again, around the base of the vaginal opening or the uh, fourchette or the perineum. So there's a lot of scarring around this base. Now, some clinicians and some patients will even say that it looks like there's a shelf. 
like a shelf of scar tissue that's kind of blocking off the entrance of the vaginal opening. So it's that shelf of scar tissue that kind of narrows the opening a bit. So when we hear about, you know, um, narrowing of the vaginal entrance, that's kind of what it's referring to. So what they can do is they can use a scalpel to kind of remove that excessive scar tissue so that you won't keep re-tearing in that area. Because what essentially happens is you tear once and then scar tissue forms as you heal. Then if you tear again, more scar tissue forms. But scar tissue with lichen sclerosis, again, it's very thick, it's very rigid, so it's not very elastic. So you've got this thick fibrotic scar tissue because it's so thick, every time you try and push it, stretch it, it's gonna tear. So they're essentially going in and then they are removing that area. And then post-op care is very, very, very important after to ensure that the surgery is as successful as possible. So you're definitely gonna to wanna to talk to your surgeon about what post-op care involves. Often it's going to involve um, a strategic use of your steroid applied to that area so that you heal open so that you're less likely again to experience that tearing and then as that area kind of heals up they may encourage you to go to pelvic floor PT to kind of do some gentle stretching and gentle work on that area again they will talk to you about what post-op entails and all the things that you can do to make sure that the surgery is as successful as possible. And on that note, let's talk about success rates for this procedure. All right, so success rates with this procedure. So to be transparent, there's not a ton of literature on this procedure in lichen sclerosis. So I am still drawing on the Flynn at all paper. Um, so again, we're going to talk about at the end of this video, vetting your surgeons and important questions to ask your surgeon before jumping into this. But from the Flynn et al. paper, it would seem that the success rates are very good overall, that most patients that get the surgery with a good surgeon that knows what they're doing are overall happy with the results. So in this study, um, they had 40, they had 20 patients in this study and 44% of patients reported being very, very satisfied with their procedure and 40% being satisfied. So a kind of 84% success rate in terms of patient satisfaction. But what about the sexual health kind of sexual pain? Did that get better? Um, and for that, we see that 33% of folks reported having pain-free sex afterwards. So 33% of them said after the procedure, sex was no longer painful. And then 58% reported improvement, but not completely pain-free. So, you know, maybe they're, and it's hard to kind of qualify that the authors don't really go into detail about, you know, what does that mean? Partial improvement or a little, uh, like some improvement. It's kind of hard to quantify since they don't really go into it. Um, but those are kind of the, the, you know, the success rates that were reported in that 2015 paper. But again, we are gonna get to why talking and asking really important questions to your surgeon is a big piece of the success. Okay, so before we move on to important questions to ask while vetting your surgeon and important things to consider before your surgery, I want to touch on a different surgical procedure that I get a lot of questions about, and this is something called perineoplasty, which is essentially plastic surgery, plastic surgery reconstruction of the perineum area. So I want to talk about this because again, I get asked a lot, like I've heard about this or my doctor said this will help with my recurrent tearing. Um, what do you think? So the truth is, is that this is a really hard question to answer if I'm going to be honest, because the literature on this is so scarce. Now there is literature on perineoplasty in general, but what I'm looking for specifically is literature that looks at this surgical procedure in the context of lichen sclerosis. So I did find a paper by Kennedy et al, which was published in 2005 that looked at peri perineoplasty for folks who experienced recurrent tearing in that kind of perineum foreshet area. 
So they basically broke down two groups of people who had recurrent tearing. So there was 42 people overall. So 20 of those individuals were treated with non-surgical interventions. We'll get to that. And then 22% of uh, 22 people received the actual surgical intervention. So the perineoplasty. Now the success rate 13 out of 20 of those people that were treating their fissures in a non-surgical way had resolution. So 13 out of 20 had success with treating it in non-surgically. And then 21 out of 22 people that had the perineoplasty had complete resolution of that fissure. That means that the perineoplasty in that group of 22 people had a 95% success rate. Okay. So I know that sounds super exciting on the face of things, right? 95% success. I mean, all but one person had complete resolution of their tearing. That sounds great. Maybe I should get this. Hold up though. Let's really sit and think about this. So if you read the paper, you realize that that statistic might not really mean much, much in the grand scheme of things, specifically for lichen sclerosis. Now, one issue with this paper is that of those 42 people involved in the study, they had a whole host of vulvar conditions. So this paper didn't specifically address only folks with lichen sclerosis. They had folks with lichen sclerosis. They had folks with lichen planus. They had folks with yeast. They had folks with vaginitis. They had folks with so many different vulvovaginal conditions. So this makes it really hard to figure things out, right? Um, because they just don't elaborate on that data. So in the group that treated non-surgically, um, with the people that had LS, not everybody in that group had LS, but the ones that did, did they, were they the ones that had success or did they not have success? Again, that's not really clear. Another question is what were those non-surgical interventions? They don't actually tell us. So we have no way of knowing, did they try to treat the steroids with fissures, uh, with the, the opposite? Did they try to treat the fissures with steroids or did they, you know, maybe do scar tissue mobilization? Did they do something else? Did they provide a different topical? We just don't know because the authors just don't tell us. And then in the surgical intervention, again, there's no real data on that. And it's not clear whether this was a long-term solution for them or not. So at the end of the day, when you really start to look at that paper, it's really not clear at all. And I'm personally left with more questions than answers. So I wouldn't feel comfortable saying to go ahead, um, go ahead with this. Um, but that's just me. I would want a little more specificity with the studies to really get a handle on how does this work for people with lichen sclerosis? Because maybe that 1% that it didn't work happened to be the person with lichen sclerosis. We don't know because these groups were full of so many different vulvovaginal conditions. So for me, I think that I would personally want to see a lot more quality studies looking at perineoplasty specifically in the case of lichen sclerosis in order to feel confident about, you know, potentially doing it or recommending it. All right, so if you are thinking of trying a surgical procedure to help correct recurrent tearing, I cannot stress enough the importance of vetting your surgeon first. And secondly, don't rush into this decision lightly. Really take the time to process and think through whether this is the right thing for you and your body. If you have a counselor or a therapist, they might be a great person to have that discussion with um, to help you kind of process and see if this is kind of where you want to be moving. And then if you decide that, yes, this is this is the direction you want to move in, that the conservative measures aren't working and you want to move forward, again, vet your surgeons. I tell you, vet your doctors, vet your therapists, vet your vet everybody, vet people. Um, and vetting is basically um, a process of asking questions to see um, if that surgeon is safe, if that surgeon is legit, if this is the person you want to go with. So what I'm going to do in a second is I'm going to pop um, 
an image of some main questions that you might want to talk with your doctor about. Um, uh, initially, feel free to pause the screen and take a screenshot so that you can kind of have that down. And of course, this list is not exhaustive. You may have other questions that you want to ask, and I encourage you to flesh this out and kind of build off this kind of template. Um, that I've given. Also, um, this will be, I'll put this in the description box um, below as well if you want to just copy and paste if you prefer that to a screenshot. You do what works best for you. Um, so here are some of the questions. So you want to ask your surgeon, have you performed this surgery before? If so, how many surgeries have you performed? Do you have many patients with lichen sclerosis? Do you feel comfortable operating on somebody with lichen sclerosis? What is your success rate for this surgery? What are the risks of this surgery? This is a really, really, really important question that you want to be having. It is so important and fundamental to the idea of informed consent that you understand not only the benefits, but the risks that are potentially associated so that you again can make the best decision for you and your body. Another question is, and this is kind of building off the risks, is what measures do you put in place to ensure that I don't kind of scar back up and start tearing again? These are really, really important questions, um, especially the risks and the kind of refusing and re-traumatization of that area. What I'm kind of getting at is, and feel free to use this word, is um, the Cobner phenomenon. So the Cobner phenomenon is the appearance of new lesions, new scarring, or a reactivation of a disease from trauma to the tissue. So the Cobner effect, therefore, is something that you want to know that A, they know that that is a thing and that they have something in place to help minimize the risk of that because any surgery to the body is a trauma. And if it is the case that, and especially with lichen sclerosis, there's a risk of that trauma kind of reactivating things or you know, creating new scarring, we wanna know that they're A, aware of that and that they have a plan in place to minimize the likelihood of that happening. So a lot of this has to do with post-op care. So the way that they put together their kind of post-op and aftercare package is going to dictate, you know, uh, hopefully is going to minimize the likelihood of that happening to you and increase the likelihood of success. So again, if you are considering these surgical procedures, please have these important conversations with your surgeon. And if those surgeons are not willing to answer those questions, then it might be time to look at a different surgeon. Um, for me, there's only, like I can probably count on my hand how many surgeons I would let perform a surgery on my vulva and that is because I need these surgeons not only to be skilled surgeons, not only to have performed this hundreds of times before and have a lot of experience, but I need these surgeons to be so familiar with lichen sclerosis skin and the extra challenges that that can bring to a surgical procedure, both during and after as my body heals and I, as, as things move on. So definitely, again, copy and paste that from the description box below or use that screenshot, fill it out with more questions you might have. And again, take your time with these decisions. Um, you know, try out the conservative measures. If those aren't helping, then, you know, kind of consider, you know, these surgical um, techniques again with perineoplasty. Personally, I don't think there's enough substantial evidence behind it for lichen sclerosis. I would want to see more robust research that is really focusing on that procedure with just lichen sclerosis patients, following them up over a longer period of time to really get an idea as how successful they are. But um, I wanna end this with one more thing that is not currently an option, but could potentially be in the future. And that is fat grafting. So um, Dr. Almadori et al. published a study in 2020 on fat grafting to improve fibrosis and scarring of the skin, and as a secondary con consequence, improve sexual health. Because the authors recognized that you know steroids can't reverse scarring. 
And the scarring is a big reason, scarring and fibrosis, that thickened tissue, is a big reason why people tear, which leads to sexual pain and sexual health issues. Now they noticed that, hey, people are using fat grafting for other conditions that include fibrosis and scarring, and it's successful there at restoring that tissue. So maybe we can apply that to lichen sclerosis skin that also has scarring and fibrosis and see if that improves the skin and if it improves sexual pain. Now what they did notice, notice in this first, first cohort was that sexual pain improvement, that was seen. People said that they had less sexual pain. There was a re reduction in symptoms overall. Uh, there was a reduction in mental health distress and clinicians did report, and by the way, this is just a visual reporting, they said that the skin of their patients looked better and they noted that the biggest improvements were actually seen in the foreshed area. So to be clear, fat grafting in this paper is not being proposed as a treatment. Instead, it's being proposed as something that may be, and we don't know yet, right? It's so the first cohort, the second cohort, the data from that is being analyzed now as I speak, and then they're putting together a randomized control trial that will take place over the next few years to see if this is effective. But if it is effective, it would be an adjunct, so an add-on to your current treatment plan to potentially help reverse some of that scarring and fibrosis and restore health to those areas so that you're less likely to experience tearing and sexual pain. Now, again, the jury is still out, but I think it is important to at least highlight that you know there are researchers and doctors that are thinking about this, that are trying to figure out you know more ways to reverse and correct the scarring that can happen with lichen sclerosis. Um, and again, I think it's really important that folks have options. I always talk about the importance of options. When you're told it's this surgery or nothing, it can feel very defeating because Maybe that surgery isn't accessible to you. Maybe you live in a country where there are no surgeons that do that, etc. But when you open it up and say you have this option, this option, this option, or that option, that places the power back in your hands. That can be very empowering to say, I get to choose. I have options instead of it's this or nothing, or like sometimes we're told there's nothing we can do, right? And that's the most defeating option is there's nothing. So I bring this up more to let you know that there are researchers looking into different ways to correct scarring so that we have more options in the future. But this is where we're currently sitting right now as I film. It is May 2023. Um, so hopefully in the future, I'm going to have more videos expanding on this, more research to share with you, more options, etc. All right, beautiful soul, that is it for this video. I hope you've learned something new. Please share in the comments if you experience recurrent tearing. If you've had the surgical vulvar lysis of adhesions, please let us know how that went. If you have had a perianoplasty, please let us know how that went. If you've tried any of these other techniques, let us know if that works for you, if it doesn't work for you. And of course, if you also have um, other topics that you would like to see us discuss in the future, you can also drop those in the comments and we will put that on our list of future things to do. So that is it for this video. I will catch you in the next one.